Good. All right. So hello, everyone out there. Um, we are really excited to have you on board for our webinar today. My name is Abby Bauer, and I'm one of the associate editors for Horde Steeryman Magazine. I'd like you to welcome, uh, um, welcome you to the webinar today. It takes a team for us to put these webinars together, and we greatly appreciate the work of our producer, Jim Baltz, who works at the University of Illinois, and our Horde Steeryman online media manager, Patty Herchin, for the behind the scenes work they do to pull the webinars together before this presentation goes live on the second Monday of each month. Ford Steryman and the University of Illinois have been co-hosting these presentations since 2011. If you're tuning into the live presentation, I wanna let you know that you can download the presentation slides and an additional handout. Go to the webinar panel and the section that says handouts, you can click the down arrow and there you'll find some additional handouts. So that's kind of a bonus for people who are listening live today. Uh, my co-host for the presentation is the very talented Mike Hutchins, who comes from the University of Illinois. Together, we have the pleasure of welcoming three speakers. So it's kind of a special webinar as we have multiple speakers today. Um, presenting will be veterinarians Rachel Close, Donald Sockett, and Jason Lombard. Mike will give you a little more detail about each of these speakers and where they work. Their presentation, which is titled, There's a New Calf Killer in Town, what you should know about Salmonella Heidelberg will be discussed um, today. We'll be talking about the particular strain of Salmonella that is impacting dairy herds in a very negative way. They have a lot of information to share with us, and we are eager to hear what they have to say. Um, this webinar is sponsored by Lando Lakes Animal Milk Products. We are very um, thankful for their support that they provided for this webinar. Mike, um, please take it from here to further introduce our speakers before we begin the presentation. Well, very good, Abby, and it's my pleasure to introduce our three speakers, and you'll see the pictures of this uh, uh, triple header. Since baseball has started, we have a triple header, not a double header, here today. Uh, to your uh, immediate left, you'll see Dr. Rachel Close. Uh, she is an epidemiologist with the Wisconsin Department of Health Services in the Division of Public Health. And her responsibilities include the disease surveillance and investigations. Rachel graduated from the University of Wisconsin Madison and uh, and doctor a doctor of veterinary medicine in two thousand four and a master's in public health in two thousand six. We're going to do introduce all the speakers now as they uh, they will then progress to the program. Our second speaker is Dr. Donald Sockett. Uh, he is a veterinary epidemiologist and microbiologist at the Wisconsin Veterinary Diagnostic Lab, and he specializes with disease and livestock. Then our third speaker on your far right over there would be Dr. Jason Lumbar. He received a DVM degree from Colorado State University in 1993, spent three, uh, 10 years as a private dairy practitioner in Wisconsin uh, before returning to Colorado State and completing a master's degree. And he is now a dairy specialist for the USDA's National Animal Health Monitoring System. So I know that's a very brief introduction, but at this point, Rachel, we will turn the, the program over to you and I'll let you roll. Okay, thank you for that introduction. So as mentioned, I am a veterinarian and I work at the Wisconsin Division of Public Health as an infectious disease epidemiologist. So in that role, I monitor disease trends for illnesses that occur in people, including salmonella. So the objective of my presentation is to provide some background about human disease investigations and knowing that Dr. Socket and Lombard are going to provide important information about the animal health concerns related to this outbreak. I want to provide some perspective on the importance of this pathogen to human health and our response. So salmonella is considered a zoonotic disease, which is a disease resulting from transmission of bacteria, parasites, or viruses between animals and people. Zoonoses have the potential to, to be transmitted in either direction, so from animal to human or vice versa. But obviously in my role at the health department, I'm identifying and investigating situations in which people become ill from having either direct contact, contact with animals, let's say from contact with a calf, or indirectly from contact with that animal's environment. So for instance, a pen or a stall that has been contaminated with manure. So just as you may be aware that certain animal diseases are reportable to agriculture agencies, in people, certain diseases or conditions, including salmonella, are reportable to local or state public health officials. And then public health agencies are charged with conducting follow-up with people diagnosed with these conditions. So some zoonotic diseases cause illnesses in people, but don't always cause illness in that animal reservoir. So if you think about E. coli 0157, that can cause severe life, 
life-threatening illness in people, but is asymptomatically fed essentially by cattle. So as part of public health follow-up in Wisconsin, interviews are conducted with, um, with all people diagnosed with salmonella infection. We do this to provide education about how to prevent spread of that illness to others in the home or in their work environment. We also ask about timing and severity of the illness. So for instance, when did someone become ill? Did they require hospitalization? What were their symptoms? And then finally, we ask about exposures during the week prior to becoming ill that could be, help us to identify a source. So types of information we ask about are what foods were consumed, did the ill person travel, was there contact with any animals or other ill people. In people, salmonella infections primarily cause a diarrheal illness, which can include bloody stools, and typically people report fevers and abdominal cramping. For most otherwise healthy adults, this will be a self-limiting illness of about a week's duration. However, in some people, salmonella infections can become invasive and cause illnesses other than diarrhea, such as bloodstream infections, joint or nervous system infections. And these more severe illnesses frequently are, lead to hospitalization and require treatment with an antibiotic. Now, some people are at increased risk of these more severe illnesses, and those include infants and young children, the elderly, and people with weakened immune systems. So ensuring we have effective antibiotics in order to treat these infections is really critical. Salmonella infections do represent a significant burden of illness. Wisconsin, with a population of just over 5.5 million people, have about 850 confirmed cases of salmonella each year reported. And nationally, there are about 42,000 salmonella infections reported. And it's important to know that these numbers only reflect illnesses that were laboratory confirmed. So someone went in and requested, and they really underestimate the true number of illnesses, which are probably closer to 1 1.2 million illnesses and 450 deaths annually in the United States. And zoonotic transmission of salmonella is estimated to account for about 11% of those infections. But as you can imagine, that's still a significant number of illnesses. In my presentation and in the sub subsequent presentations today, you'll be hearing us refer um, to this strain of salmonella Heidelberg as the outbreak strain. So I wanted to provide some background on how that determination is made. Public health labs in Wisconsin and nationally receive patient specimens from private labs where the salmonella diagnosis was made. <clears throat> and then when that public health lab gets the specimen, they are going to confirm the diagnosis and conduct DNA fingerprinting using a method we call pulsed field gel electrophoresis, or PFGE. And this allows laboratorians to determine if two isolates of a bacteria are genetically close. You can see an image of a PFGE gel on the slide, and that those bands represent segments of DNA. Now, this testing allows us to sift through hundreds of patient isolates received each year and determine which are genetically similar or matching. And then these matches likely represent illnesses from a common source and are investigated as a possible outbreak. Um, I want to just briefly mention whole genome sequencing. This might be something you start hearing about, and that's just going to be a new method and will eventually replace PFG. Um, and so that's something that we're currently transitioning to. And, and whole genome sequencing will have a better, um, uh, be more discriminating than CFGE in the future. So now I'm going to give a brief overview of this human Salmonella Heidelberg outbreak. So this map from the Centers for Disease Control and Preve Prevention, or CDC, shows each state that has had at least one person linked to this outbreak. In other words, it has had an infection with the outbreak strain. And you can see here in Wisconsin, unfortunately, we have the darkest color, meaning that the most human illnesses have been identified in our state. This outbreak was detected in August of 2016 when I was first contacted by the Wisconsin Veterinary Diagnostic Lab about a multi-drug resistant salmonella Heidelberg that was isolated from dead calves and shortly thereafter was notified by our public health lab of a cluster of Heidelberg cases and people in our state. So when we reviewed the PFG or that DNA fingerprinting, as well as our antibiotic susceptibility results, it was revealed that we had the same strain in both people and cattle. And furthermore, ill people were reporting contact with ill and dying calves when we interviewed them. We realized using that PFG um, as well, and national surveillance system that there were human cases caused by the same strain in other states. So the CDC was notified 
and has been leading the multi-state investigation, which to date has identified 56 people in 15 states, including Wisconsin, with the same outbreak strain. And there have been 17 hospitalizations among those cases. Um, more than half of uh, people, 63%, have reported contact with cattle or dairy calves. And among people that have had that cattle contact in those other states, they were, they were able to trace back the origin of those animals, and most of them had originated here in Wisconsin. So the big concern from the human health side of things about this strain of salmonella compared to some others is that it does demonstrate a concerning multi-drug resistant profile, being resistant or having reduced susceptibility to most of the first-line antibiotics used to treat salmonellosis in people. And on the human side of things, thankfully, treatment options, while limited, are still available. But you will hear more from um, the other speakers and Dr. Sockets that this resistance poses even more problems on the veterinary side of things. So this is just an epidemic curve, and this illustrates visually human illnesses over time. So time is represented on that horizontal axis, 2015 through 2018 and the number of people that became ill on the vertical axis. And you can clearly see that in the summer of 2016 when we first recognized this outbreak, mm -hmm. there is a noticeable spike in cases that summer. And that there was again a peak in 2017, although to a lesser degree. So when we look at data from older cases, you can see back in 2015, there, there were cases that occurred, but they were spread out more in time. And so they weren't recognized initially as part of an outbreak. Now, multiple uh, human and animal agencies in our state have been really involved in this investigation, in part because of the animal illnesses, but as I mentioned, also because 18 of 56 cases in people nationally have occurred in Wisconsin residents. And, and the, the number or the median age or of people who are becoming ill is young, so 19 years. And eight of those illnesses occurred in people less than 10 years of age, including three in infants, so less than a year of age. We've had seven hospitalizations. Now, in our state, most of the people have reported contact with cattle or even indirectly connected. So, for example, living or visiting a property where cattle are kept, um, but maybe they didn't directly contact the animal. So what can we do about this? Well, in addition to working with our animal health and public health partners in the state and nationally to investigate the outbreak and, and do tracebacks, we also developed a variety of websites and educational re resources and have shared these with partners for further distribution. And this is increasing awareness of the outbreak and how disease transmission can occur, reminding people about what they can take to reduce the risk to themselves and their family. And these are really core functions of, of public health. In particular, we wanted to alert the veterinary community and develop resources specifically for people with routine cattle contact. Because recognizing you can't eliminate all contact or remove all risk if you live or work on a farm. But practical reminders about what can be done are helpful. So these resources cover hand washing, remind people to change out their work, work or barn clothes and boots before getting into their cars if possible even, or at least before they go into their homes. Other recommendations include supervising children, especially young children when they're around animals, um, avoiding having, having children care for your sick or scouring calves, because we know those are the animals that are more likely to be shedding organisms that can make us ill. And then other common sense things like avoiding eating or drinking in animal areas and not drinking unpasteurized milk. So to date, this outbreak, um, especially in our state, has been largely attributed to contact with cattle, so zoonotic transmission. And a lot of our messaging to people has been around how to protect your, themselves from this mode of transmis, uh, transmission. <laughs> the big concern we have in public health is that cattle are obviously food-producing animals, and we're concerned because one foodborne outbreak from this organism has the potential to affect a much larger population. And preventing foodborne illness is really critical. Uh, tackling foodborne illness really does require a farm to fork effort, which with each step there are opportunities for prevention. And certainly we do a lot to deal with that point of service. So making sure people know to cook their food properly, not to cross contaminate it, right? So that gets at sort of that last line of the defense. Um, but other places that improvements can be made and have been over the years is in the slaughter and processing and transport 
to decrease carcass contamination. Um, but sort of getting back to that actual on-farm prevention, that maybe historically hasn't received quite as much attention as it relates specifically to the prevention of foodborne illness and salmonellosis um, from cattle. So addressing animal health and on-farm management will hopefully be one of several necessarily long-term strategies for human illness prevention for this and other drug-resistant organisms, really. So of course, sorting out how best to accomplish that end isn't easy because of the complexity of the situation. And efforts will require not just cross-agency collaboration from human and animal governmental agencies, but critically, we also need to have producers and the rest of the industry as part of that team driving activities. Drug-resistant salmonella infections in people currently account for about 1,000 infections each year, or 100,000 infections each year. And these infections do cause more severe illness and are more costly to treat. And as you'll see with this outbreak, this is not a concern of human health alone, as animal health is also being impacted. So with that, I'd like to thank my partners on this investigation and appreciate the opportunity to talk with you today. And I will pass off the baton now to Dr. Socket. Okay, my name is Dr. Don Socket. I'm a veterinary epidemiologist and microbiologist at the Wisconsin Vet Diagnostic Laboratory. And it's a pleasure to be here today and give this talk and my slides are, and I wanna say that this has been a team approach. This has been much bigger than one person and, and we're fortunate, quite fortunate in Wisconsin that we have a good working relationship with, with uh, the State Public Lab of Hygiene and the Division of Public Health. Without their assistance, we would, would have taken a lot longer to, to figure out what is exactly going on. So uh, we first start, as Rachel Close, uh, Dr. Rachel Close mentioned earlier, we first start seeing cases of high de death loss and people getting sick in the summer of 2016. And we have a, a memorandum of understanding with State Lab of Hygiene whenever uh, people get sick with salmonellosis, farm labor, and we know the livestock are sick, we send the, the isolate over the state lab of hygiene to see if, there, if there's a match. So, well, so this is just to show you this picture here. This is pulse field gel electrophoresis, and these are different isolates from cattle that got sick and have died of Salmonella Heidelberg. And basically, they basically show you that the strains are very closely related. They don't vary very much and they're virtually identical to the human strain. And what we found really interesting when we talked to the CDC about this case is in CDC's database, they got fingerprints just like this from over 24,000 people where, they have, where they've isolated Sam and Heidelberg from who become ill. And less than 100 of the people in the CDC database match this fingerprint. So this is a very rare strain. It's unique to dairy cattle. And, and as Rachel, Dr. Close mentioned earlier, most of our cases uh, have originated from Wisconsin. So in Wisconsin, it's been estimated by livestock dealers and truckers that approximately 90% of our dairy beef calves leave the state. And basically most of the cases that we see are dairy beef calves. Well over 80% of the confirmed cases of Salmonella Heidelberg has been, is dairy beef calves. It appears that uh, Dr. Jason Lumbar will get into this, but heat and cold stress are important risk factors. Uh, we work with one research farm that's located out of state where they check all the calves upon entry for failure pass or transfer antibody. And they had just as high a death loss uh, in calves that had a good colostrum intakes as calves that did not get enough colostrum. So colostrum just tells you if they get uh, 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 Get, an, get general test for antibodies. It doesn't tell you if you've got specific immunity to salmonella. So clearly getting enough colostrum was not protective in this study from calves dying of salmonella Heidelberg. It's interesting that diarrhea is not a consistent finding in these calves. And typically uh, calves start getting sick typically five to 10 days post arrival. They're usually one to two uh, weeks of age. And what was so profound about this outbreak is these calves die very quickly. Uh, it's very, very hard on the animal caregivers because these, these calves are, are dying so quickly. It's 
not unusual. You'll hear stories where the calves are fed in the morning. They look fine. They go out mid-afternoon to check on the calves, and they think they're sleeping, but they can't wake them up because they're dead. So we've never seen a salmonella kill calves this fast before. And what the calves are dying of is a generalized bacteremia septicemia, which means the bacteria leaves the gut, spreads through the bloodstream throughout the body, and causes death of the animals. The death losses we've seen has been as low as 20% to as high as 65%. The average mortality we see in these cases is around 35, 38%. And what's very discouraging about it is all these calf raising facilities where we've gone in and looked at them, we've determined that current best practices for the dairy industry will not reduce the death loss uh, in these calves. So this, in What's so just disconcerting about it is many of these uh, dairy beef producers who experience these catastrophic death losses have, have exited the marketplace and no longer raise calves anymore. This is a graph just to show you in timeline, in time going from 15 up to 2017, that as the incidence goes up in cattle, you will start uh, cattle in red and humans in blue. You'll, the human cases tend to follow. So what's really interesting about these, some, about half the calves, maybe 60% of them when they die, when the veterinarians open them up to, to, do, to look at them, to try to determine the cause of death, they don't see anything grossly. And the reason they don't see anything is because the calves die too quickly for lesions to develop. But if we do see anything, Pretty consistently, we'll see large, very large mesenteric lymph nodes, and I have some pictures of that. Histologically, we may see a suppurative of enteritis and lymphadenitis, and I got some pictures of that. And we may see a mild interstitial pneumonia. There is no, uh, since this is dairy beef, there is no antibiotic approved for use in dairy calves in the United States that has, that, that has activity against this organism. Very dangerous, multi-drug resistant, no antibiotic can be used to uh, treat sick animals, so all you can do is give supportive care. And even if you're doing everything right, you will typically, the best of the best, lose 20 to 25% of their dairy beef calves. Proper and cleaning and disinfection of premises after they've had an outbreak is very problematic because of facility design, is a lack of sanitary design in our livestock facilities, and there's also a general lack of proper knowledge in the industry in how to do proper cleaning and disinfection. Um, it, some very limited uh, observational uh, studies without a lot of data yet. Uh, probiotics may help uh, uh, with Salmonella Heidelberg outbreaks. And then it, probiotics in an effort to try to establish a normal gut microbiome. This is a picture of a calf. This calf was fine. At 7 a.m. in the morning, it drank its mouth, its, its meal vigorously, and it was dead at 2 in the afternoon. And when the veterinarian opened it up, you can see a fibrinous peritonitis. You can see these fibrin tags here. And these are these enlarged mesenteric lymph nodes that we talk about. Those are about three to four, maybe five times larger than normal. They're very enlarged and very edematous. Histologically, this is a section of the small intestine in the terminal ileum. The one I want to try to show you is along here. Normally, you see nice villi in the intestine, and the villi are gone, and this is just uh, proteinaceous fluid here, which we call a pseudodipteritic membrane. This is the lumen of the gut, and this is a picture here to show you some of these cases. We'll see vascular thrombosis or blood clots in the vasculature of the submucosa of the intestine. This is a picture of the Pyre's patch area, and this is just to show you, this should be a solid purple here, and you shouldn't see this white here, which tells us there's lymphoid depletion in these animals. So some final thoughts about this. Is not all salmonella behave the same? Different salmon have different abilities to cause illness and death loss in our, in our dairy animals. And it's very important to know the serotype and when indicated due molecular fingerprinting as well. In dairy calves, 
these are the, the big killers that you need to know about. Salmonel Dublin, Schwarzengrund, Newport, 4512I negative, Heidelberg in Santa, Santa, Santa Panama. So when, when we work with dairy calves, when you get a salmonella isolate, very important to know the serotype so you know how aggressive you have to be in supportive care for the animals and how aggressive you have to be to clean and dis, dis, decontaminate the facility after the calves leave. Some final thoughts. More diagnostic laboratories in the United States need to do serotyping. It's a, I can, cannot deal with a salmonella uh, outbreak without knowing the serotype because that gives me clues of how to attack it. Collaboration with state veterinary diagnostic labs and public health laboratories and the CDC is essential. We need the agriculture equivalent, which uh, PulseNet, PulseNet is what the CDC uses on the human side to track salmonella outbreaks in humans to see if there's clustering or, or how similar the, the salmonella strains are with each other. We don't have an agriculture equivalent of that. So we don't have a good way to say if you have a salmonel Dublin found in Wisconsin, how closely it matches a salmonel Dublin found, let's say, in Washington State. A little bit of thoughts on vaccinating. Vaccines are an important tool, but their efficacy is only 25 to 60 percent in adult animals. The efficacy in calves is less than 50 percent. They they may provide protection for getting sick, but they do not provide protection from infection and they do not provide protection from shedding of the organism. Proper cleaning and sanitation is essential for uh, salmonella control, and proper cleaning, you must focus on what do you do once the bedding material is removed to remove the biofilm layer. And so what you need to do is low pressure foam cleaning and proper disinfection in high risk areas of infected herds. When I do my audits for clean disinfection, I verify they've been done correctly with an ATP meter. And one of the biggest problems in our dairy industry in critical control points where we have immune compromised animals such as close-up pens, calving pens, hospital pens, pre-weaned calf barns and calf feed mixing rooms, we don't have a sanitary design. And you think you cannot clean and disinfect without water. And the biggest problem I see in, in high risk areas when you try to do proper clean disinfection is the lack of sanitary design and a design for drainage for the water to, to drain the water when you're doing your cleaning. This is a handheld foamer, works quite well for smaller areas to do your, your, your proper cleaning, low pressure foam cleaning. This is the ATP meter I use, Zygena, uh, to verify that the cleaning has been done properly. This is an example of a nice sanitary design. This is the new dairy at the University of Guelph at the Allura Research Farm. Nice sanitary design. Everything sealed up nice, beautiful, easy to clean. These are the sanitary design calf pens, which, is, so, which, which we need to properly clean and disinfect our facilities. And so I will now turn it over to Dr. Jason Lombard. Thank you, Dr. Sackett. So um, I want to talk to you today a little bit and give, provide some preliminary results from our own farm investigation that gives us a few insights into practices that increase the risk of cattle operations acquiring Salmonella Heidelberg. So this investigation was really the result of collaboration among the agencies and people on this slide. My organization, Veterinary Services, became involved in the outbreak uh, because we were requested to assist the Wisconsin Department of Agriculture, Trade and Consumer Protection in December of 2016. So we've been working on this for a while. It was through meetings with Drs. Patton and Socket and the folks at the National Veterinary Services Laboratory that we came up with this study design. I was also fortunate enough to have Dr. Putnam, who was working on her master's in public health degree, assist in the analysis. And like I said, I'll be mentioning preliminary results today. So this map of Wisconsin shows the distribution of cattle and human cases. So each dot represents either one or two cattle operations within that county where Salmonella Heidelberg was isolated from submissions to the Wisconsin Veterinary Diagnostic Lab. There were 18 human cases uh, located in the, in the 14 shaded counties on the map. And I think the really the take home message from this map is that Salmonella Heidelberg is fairly widely distributed across Wisconsin and it is present in all the dairy areas. 
So the current investigation involved designing and implementing a case control study based on calf submissions to the Wisconsin Veterinary Diagnostic Lab. Operations that submitted calf samples where Heidelberg were isolated were assigned as cases, and those operations were eligible to participate in our study. Alternatively, operations that submitted calves where Salmonella wasn't isolated were eligible to be control operations in our study. We also wanted to determine if Heidelberg was present on case operations and confirm that it wasn't present on control operations. So we set up a sampling scheme to test for Salmonella. If a control operation was found to have Salmonella, then we were gonna have to exclude them from our study. Luckily, uh, at this point, we haven't had any control operations where we've identified Salmonella Heidelberg. And the goal of the investigation was really to answer these three questions regarding Salmonella Heidelberg. What are the potential sources? What practices are involved in the spread? And what practices can we implement it to control the, the disease? So to gather information on farm level demographics and practices, including herd additions and biosecurities, which I bolded here, a questionnaire was developed and administered to all case and control operations that agreed to participate. The questionnaire was fairly extensive and targeted additional areas such as calf sales, movement and health, cattle health, human illness, and also the information that was provided by the Wisconsin Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory on case and control calves that were submitted. Sample collection was targeted to yields to areas likely to yield Heidelberg, which was mainly really the pre-weaned calf area. We didn't have uh, really a good idea of where else we might find it on a farm, and so we, we focused on where the sick animals were. Uh, based on advice from Dr. Lance at National Veterinary Services Laboratory, we decided to implement the boot cover swabs for sampling. Um, and up to 10 samples were collected and submitted for each operation, but the boot swabs were required from each, each operation. Both NVSL and the Wisconsin Veterinary Diagnostic Lab were involved in testing of the samples. The booties, which are represented here, are commonly used to sample environments in poultry operations, and we found them really easy to use, and they turned out to be one of the best samples that we collected on these farms. They're just really fabric swabs that are placed over plastic or or other boots that you can still disinfect. Uh, in addition to the to the booties, we use Swiffer Swiffer wipes for sampling walls, fences, and and other objects. For our for our testing, one of the booties was sent to the Wisconsin Diagnostic Lab, and the other uh, booty and the rest of the samples were sent to NBSL. I really want to reiterate how well the booties and the and the swabs did the and the Swiffer wipes in terms of. Uh, finding Heidelberg if it was on the operation. And we encourage veterinarians that are collecting samples on calf operations to consider using them um, for their sampling. So moving on to the preliminary results, we have 20 far 21 farms that have completed the investigation so far. Uh, ideally, we'd like to have about 35 before we conclude the study. So Dr. Socket continues to inform us if new cases are presented to the diagnostic lab so we can follow up with them and ask them to participate in our study. For the comparisons that I'll be presenting, we have chosen a statistical significance cutoff of 0.1. Uh, most studies use a, a cutoff of 0.05, which just suggests that, that they're requiring more evidence of a difference uh, in practices before they'll say that it's a risky practice. But since this is really our first investigation into Heidelberg, we wanted to be a little more cautious about describing practices as not being different between cases and control. So we're being a little bit more liberal on our cutoff. The demographic variable that we evaluated was herd size. And I've, uh, these slides are all set up similarly here on the, the left side or the Y axis is the percent of operations. We've got the, the P value up here. And then the, the cases are represented by red bars and the control operations are represented by blue bars. So uh, with herd size, even though we had differences in distribution of the, of the uh, percent of cases and controls in the median and medium and large herd sizes. Uh, based on our statistical value of 0.67, there were really no differences uh, in risk of being a case or a control operation based on, based on size. So bringing cattle onto the operation is one of the most likely sources for, for Heidelberg. We find it in calves and, and they're moving around. We found that all case operations, 100% of them had purchased herd additions. Uh, and we asked them to go back in their records to January 1st of 2016 to, to provide us this information. While only 73% of the control herds had, had added cattle. And this was a, a significant difference between the two herd, between the cases and control operations. 
In order to look at herd additions a little bit more thoroughly, we divided the number of herd additions that the producers reported by the total number of calves on the operation from that January 1st, 2016 through the day of the interview. And what we found was that higher percentage of case operations had, had brought on more than 100% of their calf inventory. And so herd additions could include uh, animals beside or cattle beside just calves. And this was statistically significantly different. So it appears that, that the more cattle you bring onto the operation, and we know that anytime you bring cattle onto the operation, they come with a risk of disease introduction, but the more cattle you bring on, you're just increasing that risk of, of bringing additional disease on to the operation. We speculated that the source of the cattle or the calves would also impact the likelihood of acquiring Heidelberg. And so we evaluated dairy operations and you can see that over half of both case and control operations brought on uh, additions from dairy operations and those were not significantly different. Dealers were the next source evaluated and half of case operations, 50%, had acquired calves from dealers but no control operations had used dealers to acquire calves. So uh, a pretty significant p-value, 0.01, uh, led us to the conclusion that purchasing calves from dealers were a significant risk for acquiring Heidelberg. We saw a similar pattern with purchasing calves from markets. Half of the cases, but only 9% of the controls had acquired calves from markets. And again, this was significant. Uh, purchasing calves from dealers and markets increased the risk of acquiring Heidelberg. And the likely reason why dealers and markets are associated with, with Heidelberg is not something they are intentionally doing to increase the risk, obviously. It what, it's what happens along the supply chain. Calves that are sold to dealers and through markets are commonly exposed not only to cattle from other operations, but pathogens such as Salmonella, Heidelberg, and others. So we, we bring these cattle together either at a dealer or through a market, and we're mixing cattle and that's creating stress. We're transporting those cattle and that's leading to additional stress. And these stressors build up until we have shedding of these pathogens from some of the calves and the calves that aren't necessarily shedding path pathogens are, are more susceptible to those pathogens that are shed by the other calves. So um, what we essentially end up with is transfer of, of these pathogens uh, from animal to animal in these stressful situations. We all know that cleaning is important to keeping disease at low levels, and Dr. Socket touched on that momentarily. Although we couldn't evaluate the actual cleaning process on the farms that we've, we've surveyed, we, we did ask fairly detailed questions. One of the questions we did ask about was cleaning transport vehicles, um, hauling calves to the operation. And interestingly, a higher percentage of case than control operations reported cleaning transport vehicles after each shipment. So 71% of our case operations reported cleaning after each shipment, while 100% of our control operations reported that cleaning was just performed as needed, or they really didn't know, maybe somebody else was hauling the, the calves for them. In this case, cleaning was associated with being a case operation, but obviously we still highly recommend cleaning uh, vehicles after each shipment. After cleaning, disinfection is important, and we saw a similar scene with, with disinfection where two-thirds of our case operations reported disinfecting those calf transport vehicles, and 100% of our control operations reported not cleaning um, those, or I'm sorry, not disinfecting those vehicles. We still highly recommend uh, cleaning and disinfecting of, of calf transport vehicles, obviously. The last factor we evaluated relative to transport was the distance the calves were transported. And we used 50 miles as our cutoff, and we found that 75% of our control farms reported that the calves were, were transported less than 75 miles, while 75% of our case operations reported that calves were transported 50 or more miles. And so the, the miles calves were transported were associated with acquiring Heidelberg. And we know from other studies that miles transport is just one of the components of transport. Obviously, time in transport and temperature are also very likely important. And as I mentioned earlier about um, having more calves and the, that stress in the, in the transport and the mixing, well, the longer the calves are in transport, the higher their stress, resulting in either increased shedding or increased susceptibility to disease. Um, and heat and cold stress too, as Dr. Socket mentioned, are important. Uh, interesting, when you look back in the literature, there are not 
very few there are very few studies evaluating the effect of transport on these very young calves. So I think we have an opportunity to uh, do some investigation into what can we do better in terms of transporting calves. Do is there something that we can provide them ahead of time? Do we need to keep these calves on the farm uh, a little bit longer before we transport them? And and at least from my review of the literature, we really don't have good answers to those questions. The last practice we asked about was the cleaning of calf housing with water or steam. Um, and similar to our other cleaning practices, we saw 92% of our case operations and only 55% of our control operations reported cleaning uh, calf housing with, with water or steam. Um, there have been some studies showing that pressure washing before disinfecting, so if there's still live organisms on, on whatever you're pressure washing, that you can actually aerosolize those and move those around in the environment without killing them. Um, so we need to be careful about, about how we pressure wash and, and um, make sure that we're killing organisms before we move in with high pressure washers. And when we, when we do have personnel using high pressure equipment around um, calves that are infected with Salmonella, Heidelberg, or other uh, zoonotic diseases, uh, we need to be careful about not exposing them to, to those organisms as well, ending up with human infections. Okay, now we'll move on to the culture results from the samples collected. We've collected 200 samples, 46 or 23% of those were culture positive for Salmonella Heidelberg, 98 or 49% of the, the samples had any type of Salmonella in including Heidelberg. Interestingly, we found uh, two case farms, two of the 11 that had no Salmonella Heidelberg from the samples that we collected. And we had two of our control farms uh, had no Salmonella found in any of the samples um, on those farms. So this graph shows the sources of the Heidelberg positive samples and almost half of the samples, 46% came from calf housing. The remaining positive samples were equally distributed among the boot swabs, individual calf samples, and the milk preparation area. So calf housing would be the, the hutches or the or the panels in the in the calf area. The boot cover swabs performed really well in terms of if we found Salmonella Heidelberg in any of the other samples from, from an operation, we found it on the boot cover swabs. But the the high percentage of, of positive samples from calf housing really reinforces the the fact that calves on case operations were contaminating their environment. And since some of these samples that we collected were months after the diagnostic laboratory had diagnosed Heidelberg, um, it isn't easily eliminated from some of these calf areas. And that may be due to, to design or the actual cleaning processes that were used. Okay, so this graph illustrates the percent of samples from each operation that were positive for Salmonella Heidelberg. And so uh, we've just got the farm, the 11, control case farms down here on the on the x-axis and we we see that the there were two farms that had no salmonella heidelberg and then the the other nine farms that did the percent of samples that were positive ranged from 20 to 100 percent of those of those samples and as i mentioned we had none of our control farms where we were able to isolate salmonella heidelberg so that's a good thing this, slide's build, this slide builds off the previous slide. I've added any Salmonella positive samples to the graph. And you can see that here we have uh, farm 12 and 13, no Salmonella positive samples on those two control operations. Otherwise, the percent positive samples for Salmonella range from about 10 to 100%. And in general, we found a higher percent of positive samples uh, or positive for Salmonella samples on case operations than we did on control operations. So in summary, the source of the calves appears to be associated with acquiring Heidelberg. Um, case operations were more likely to purchase calves from dealers or markets than control operations. Case operations were more likely to bring on a higher percentage of calf inventory, and those calves were more likely to have traveled 50 or more miles. Cleaning of calf transport vehicles and calf housing was performed by a higher percentage of cases, but obviously we don't believe that to be a risky practice. Heidelberg was frequently found in calf areas on, on case operations, and the booties that I mentioned um, turned out to be an excellent sample. And based on finding the Heidelberg on these booties, this suggests that the calf personnel are probably involved in moving this organism around the operation.
So we do have an info sheet that's available in the additional information handouts that Abby mentioned at the beginning of the webinar. And I'd like to thank you for joining the webinar today. If you're a producer having calf deaths that could be caused by Salmonella Heidelberg or calf deaths for any reason, I recommend you contact your veterinarian. If any calves from your operation have been diagnosed with Heidelberg and you'd like to participate in our study, please contact Dr. Socket or myself. Thank you. Well, very good. Abby, I guess, uh, do you want to, uh, before we go to the Q&A, do you have any other comments you want to add at this point? Yes, Mike, thank you. Um, first of all, a huge thank you to Dr. Close, um, Dr. Socket, and Dr. Lombard for sharing that um, great information. Um, anyone who's raising calves or dealing with animal health knows how challenging it can be when things um, start going stray and animals are sick and this sounds like very fast moving detrimental disease. So appreciate you sharing that information and maybe some of the risk factors that are out there that can hopefully be prevented on many of our dairy farms. Um, if anyone wants to listen to this webinar again or listen to any of our past webinars from the last seven years, um, you can do so on our archives. To visit the archives, just go to www.hordes.com slash webinars. For all of you that are listening, I want to let you know that you'll also be receiving an email survey later this week. We use that survey um, to ask you some questions about the presenter and the topic, and we want your feedback because we use that to plan some future webinars and pick speakers for um, future presentations. So we definitely appreciate you taking the time to fill out those couple of questions. We also hope that you'll make plans to attend our next webinar, which will take place next month on Monday, May 14th. The title of that presentation is Calf Rearing Affects Lifetime Eating Behavior. Our speaker for that presentation will be Trevor DeVries from the University of Guelph. I'm definitely looking forward to hearing what he has to say on that topic. And again, we'll be kind of touching on calf care. So some of you might be particularly interested in that. The sponsor for that webinar is Advanced Agri Solutions. So thankful to them um, for their support of that future webinar. So Mike, now would be a great time if you want to share some of the listener questions and ask our presenters for their input. You bet. Very good. Well, uh, Dr. Close, I think we'll start out with you and uh, and come in with uh, the question about uh, is there more problems in warm weather versus uh, as far as number of cases being reported on the human side versus cold weather? One of those slides showed that epidemic curve when, when people became ill, and, and we do see peaks um, in human and actually the animal cases, if I think Don can back me up on that, uh, during the summer months. And, and that's true of actually all our reported salmonella infections, even the non-Heidelbergs. We tend to see increases during the summer months. Okay. Dr. Socket, a uh, question for you, and that is, what is the associated cost of uh, doing the, the fingerprinting there? Uh, if, if, if Do you have to work that through your local veterinarian? Can a farmer, uh, how, how do you access that? Uh, oh, you, you mean you're talking about the serotyping? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Well, uh, a veterinarian can send us a salmonella isolate, and we can serotype that. Or we can get a diagnostic sample, we isolate the salmonella, and then we do the serotyping. Uh, the cost of doing a salmonella culture is about, is about with the accession fees, about $35, and the cost of serotyping is about $30, $30. Okay. Do you recommend that, then, as a routine thing to do, or, or in case you're having more problems on a farm? I think, I think every salmonella isolate should be serotyped. Because you need to know if you're dealing with a dangerous strain or not, or where you're dealing with a, a more hum, humdrum strain that you don't need to worry as much about. So the reason you need to know about the dangerous strains, because the dangerous strains, current best practice for the dairy industry is insufficient to control it. So that means you got to go above and beyond current best practices to get on top of it. Okay, uh, Dr. Lombard, a uh, question here. Uh, are there, uh, what are your thoughts of why uh, cleaning and disinfecting of the trailers didn't reduce the incidence of uh, Heidelberg uh, on farms in your survey? Yeah, that would just be pure speculation on my part. I think that uh, the, the contamination or the exposure to the calves hap is happening in transit, and if they're moving quite a few calves based on the percentage of their calf inventory. Um, they're just bringing in enough calves that they're, that they're getting one that has, that has Heidelberg and those calves are getting exposed 
during the transport on the trailer. And so by the time they come home, uh, clean the trailer, it's already too late. Um, those calves have, have already been exposed uh, from other, other uh, calves on the trailer. Okay. That's pure speculation on my part, though. Oh, speculation is good. Speculation is good. Uh, moving on, Dr. Kloss, uh, close uh, question about unpasteurized milk. Sometimes that's made into some cheeses and then held for a period of time. It, your comments on that, any risks, concerns, any speculation on that? Um, well, so we don't recommend consuming unpasteurized milk or dairy. There are... Um, from the regulatory side, you can make and produce legally um, unpasteurized um, milk that becomes cheese as long as it's aged for the appropriate time frame. So, um, you know, I guess from the regulatory standpoint, those are safe if they're aged, aged long enough. Okay. Dr. Sockett, is there any research or evidence uh, looking at farms that feed fresh colostrum to calves versus those that are fro that's frozen as far as that goes and then thawed or even using a colostrum replacer just avoiding the whole, the whole colostrum thing? Any comments on colostrum management with this disease? Well, I was trying to say is at the research farm, where they checked all the calves for, for how much colostrum they got at birth. They checked them upon arrival, whether they had failure, passive transfer, and how much colostrum they had. Calves that had very high levels of the colostrum in their blood had, you know, were just as likely to die as calves that got very little colostrum. But the problem is we weren't measuring immunity to Salmonella Heidelberg. We're just measuring whether they had enough colostrum intake or not. So what, this, what it told me is probably most of these calves have very little salmonella immunity. So if there's very little salmonella immunity in the colostrum, given a lot of colostrum, the calf is not going to do is not going to help you when you get a very invasive strain of salmonella like salmonella Heidelberg. Let's follow this, up. This on Jason, our, um, I just yeah, go ahead, this, Jason. Jason. I just want to I just want to chime in that um, you know that that's one one farm, so we need to be a little careful about um, making a making a recommendation or anything based on that. I think the other thing is that we can overwhelm our colostrum management with stress uh, via transport and, and other factors. So uh, I, I think that uh, these calves were hauled out of state. They were probably hauled for a longer distance uh, than a lot of the calves. And so uh, we definitely don't want people to back off on their colostrum management program at all. And uh, I think it's maybe a little too early to say that, that uh, colostrum management doesn't uh, have an impact on protecting some farms from from salmonella with just this one farm's uh, well, I results. Thought, I thought specific about Heidelberg and these dairy beef calves. And we've had other farms where calves are hauled a shorter distance where we had high death loss. So not getting the weeds too much, I'm like trying to say this strain is so dangerous. Even when you're doing everything right, you can have these catastrophic disease outbreaks. That's the point. So, so then when you got so now you got a heavily contaminated facility. Now what are you going to do? And we've had multiple situations where the facility, after the calves left, after proper clean, it, after cleaning and disinfection, the facility was the source of ongoing outbreaks. And that follows up on a so question. It, could, could colostrum be a vector? Could the colostrum, in other words, if it's not pasteurized, colostrum, could it be contaminated and that gets that, that, that exposes the calf to the disease? We don't know the answer to that question. All we do know is it's very uncommon to see illness in adult animals from, from Salmon L. Heidelberg. That's been one of the more surprising <laughs> things for us is how, rare, how uncommon it is for adult cows to be sick from Heidelberg. doesn't happen very often. You, you must be looking at the screen because the question came in about adult cows. Do they build immunity to it? Do you want to speculate why do adult cows uh, and older heifers, I assume, so would fall in that same category of not having uh, immunity to that? Or, or you want to speculate why? Well, I can speculate, but, I, but this is just an opinion, and it may not be correct. But I think what's going on with these, these calves, these high-stress calves, you, they're – they're, they're, they're trucked large distances. They go many hours without eating, right? 
And so what we, we think is going on is these calves, when there's with that amount of stress, haven't eaten for one or two days, truck long distance, mixing with uh, strangers, heat stress, cold stress, all that stuff, it increases gut permeability. And so what that means is, let's say you bring 100 calves in, you only need one colonized with Heidelberg. It, it starts shedding large numbers, and then, and then it spreads throughout the livestock in, uh, operation. But because the gut is more permeable, it makes it much easier for the bacteria to leave the gut, get in the systemic circulation, and kill the animal. Because what's really interesting about this is we don't see these catastrophic death losses in dairy heifer calves raised on, at home and exposed to Heidelberg. We don't see this catastrophic death loss. So there's something about the stress of mingling groups of animals, transit, all these things are working together. Then, Dr. Lumbar, another question came in, and that is you, you mentioned about the age of the animal, or maybe uh, Dr. Sockett, you want to jump in as well. Uh, if this is a problem, should we say no calves should be transported until they're 21 days or seven days? Do you want to give me a number on that in terms of reducing the risk as it relates to the age of transporting uh, or stressing these calves? Well, I think some of Don, this Jason, some of Don's work has shown that. Uh, the calves that have come into the diagnostic lab, I don't believe any of them with Heidelberg have been over about 28 days of age other than the, than uh, one or two uh, random adult animals. I don't think we have any information to suggest at what day of age calves should be shipped. Uh, but um, just intuitively, you would think that maybe they shouldn't be shipped before they're 24, 36, 48 hours old. Um, but we have we don't have good data to support a day when when they would be uh, less susceptible to the stress of shipping. And uh, we also don't have good information on what happens to these calves in uh, February in Wisconsin when they're on a trailer for six hours or uh, in July on a trailer for six hours in terms of what's going on physiologically with these calves that we need to be concerned about. A lot more questions than answers. I hear you. Uh, Dr. Sockett, the vaccination, we've got a couple of questions on vaccination. Uh, is there a vaccination that could be used uh, on the uh, on, on this program? And is there any evidence of uh, if you use a, a S double in vaccine and they use the word intervene, intervene dash D to get crossover protection? Comments on vaccination. The safe thing to say is we don't know. But what I can say is this, is that if you're relying on vaccination, if you're relying on vaccination of the calves, uh, pre, you know, calves less than a month of age, it, they've been relatively unsuccessful for salmonella control. So yeah, if you're going to think about vaccination, you got to think about vaccinating the mothers and get maternal immunity to the calves via the colostrum. So you're asking good questions. We just don't know the answers to them. Okay. Uh, Dr. Close, a question oh, for you. Go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, uh, Dr. Lombard. I just think a vaccine is a tool that you a tool in the toolbox, but you can't rely on vaccines alone. Okay. Uh, the question of, uh, uh, for uh, Dr. Close, uh, what about the infants? You had three infants identified uh, in, in your study. Uh, is that just coming from uh, people contaminating or exposing the infant to the, the, to, to the organism? Any comments on the infant? I mean, obviously, they weren't on a tour. They weren't probably out in the barn. Right. Um, so, of course, a little bit is speculation when we have these infant illnesses, um, but we do see high rates of, of salmonella in general in infants and, um, and, and in this case and in others, a lot of times what we know is that someone in their home works on a, on a farm um, and so we do speculate that there was some sort of um, cross-contamination, you know, that was probably minor, um, but that kind of gets back to those recommendations to try to do your best to, you know, change clothes and boots, um, wash hands, and those sorts of things before coming into your home, especially if you have young kids or kids or people that have these problems. 
Well, very good. Uh, we're, uh, we're getting more questions than we have time. Uh, here's an interesting one, though, and and, and that is, uh, what what about transfer uh, interuterus? Uh, could, could these calves already be exposed when they're born from the cow herself? Comments on that, veterinarians? I think that's not the Dr. Socket here. I think it's highly unlikely just because we see so seldom we see illness in adult cows. Okay. It's, it's, it's highly unlikely, but it's theoretically possible. Okay. Um, here is one. I'm just going to read it because I'm afraid I'm going to mess it up. What is the value of serotyping all salmonella isolates to determine uh, is is the strain a serious strain when uh, uh, strain types can be identified by the death of the calf and if there are no treatments for these strains? So why do we even want to check them out if it's uh, if we can't, um, we have to wait for uh, a dead calf, or we can't treat them or vaccinate them. Pretty tough well, we question. Can of, we can serotype a fecal sample. We don't have to wait for the calf to die, right? So when so so you get a group of calves, they suddenly get sick, and there's salmonellosis, and the death, and and you and you send it in. It's really important to know wh whether you're dealing with a uh, with a, a more lethal strain than not. Because if you're dealing with lethal strain, then you got to really focus more on your treatment protocols for sick animals. How you're going to prevent uh, exposure from uh, between groups of animals, and and then and the other thing is how you're going to clean up your your your, your premises, proper clean and disinfection a after the uh, it's run its course. Okay. Well, Abby, I think we've got most of the questions that came in here at this point. Uh, do you want to wrap up our 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 our, our webinar for today? Yes, thanks, Mike. Um, definitely want to send a thank you out to Lando Lakes Animal Milk Products for their support of the webinar today. And if you want to learn more about their company, you can visit the website that's listed on the slide. Um, again, thank them for their generous support and partnering with us to present this webinar to you all. Um, thank you for submitting the great questions that you did, and that really helps our presenters be able to share with you a little additional information. Um, and it's glad to know that you're interested and engaged in the webinar. We hope that you will um, join us again next month at the same time, same place on May 14th. And we will be talking about calf rearing and how that affects the lifetime eating behavior presented by Trevor DeVries. Um, again, that's sponsored by um, um, Advanced Agra Solutions. Um, the following presentation will be June 11th. And that title is A Complete Hoof Care Plan presented by Carl Berge of Dairyland Hoof Care and sponsored by Zimpro Performance Minerals. Again, thank you all for joining in. Um, and we were very happy to have a great audience out there today. We had three very knowledgeable presenters and glad that the technology allowed us to all be together um, in one place, even though we came from multiple locations. Um, thank you all for joining us. Uh, we appreciate your attendance and we look forward to having you join us again on a future webinar. Until next time, goodbye to you all from Horde Steeryman and the University of Illinois webinar team. <laughs>